Okay. So once again, thank you for joining us today. For this session, we've decided to use um, the audio broadcast option, and therefore you should be using the sound on your computer to hear us. I know some people have asked if, if they could join a teleconference, so that means that they've dialed in using their phones, which is fine. Um, and uh, we don't have a problem with that as well, if that's the easiest way for you to connect. Uh, but we just found that we were ending up spending so much of our webinar time trying to get people connected to the call that the easiest way was just to broadcast. So if you do have any questions throughout the session, we're going to ask you to make use of the chat facility. Now, um, as some of you who were on the call early might have heard me say, if you choose the chat to myself, Janice Pranstatter, or my colleague, Samantha Clues, or to choose all panelists, that way we can pick up on questions and we can share it out with the rest of the group. Unfortunately, at this time, the chat can only be seen by the panelists. It can't be seen by all of the participants within the group, but we are um, working to try and, and fix that. So just to introduce myself, my name is Janice Pranstatter, and I'm a teaching and learning consultant um, for Promethean. I do come from a primary teaching background. And Samantha Clues is going to be the presenter for today, and uh, she um, is still kind of a teaching and learning consultant, but her role has changed slightly to business development manager for Ireland. Um, but uh, she is still, um, thankfully, supporting me with running these webinars. So once again, I'm just going to get Sam to turn that page. Thank you very much. Um, just on the screen now is some idea of what we'll cover today. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to pass you over to Sam, mm -hmm. and she's going to get you started, and I'll take over the um, chat here and see if I can help these people who are having problems. Right, Sam, if you want to get started. Thanks very much, Janice. Um, so for those of you that have been on our sessions before, this particular slide is usually full of all the tips and tricks and ideas that we're going to use with an Active Inspire. But today's session is slightly different because we're looking at um, like an educational philosophy. So we're looking at thinking skills as a whole topic. So although obviously I am going to be talking about tips and tricks and how you can utilize those within Act to Inspire, we are talking about those wider skills, um, thinking skills um, that we want our students to learn and how we can use our technology in the classroom to help develop those skills. So. Um, as Janice said, the chat functionality is open to you. I've turned it off, although I can see them coming in on the screen, at the top of the screen, but that's just to make sure that I've got access to my full screen as it's there. And Janice will interrupt me throughout with any questions that you pose. So please do, um, do participate, do use the chat. It makes these sessions run a lot, uh, a lot more exciting for us, at least, and we know that you're all there listening. So I'm going to start today's session just by... Um, giving everyone an overview of what thinking skills are. So I'm sure that many of you will have heard the term thinking skills, and for those of you that aren't from the UK or Ireland, you may have um, heard um, of these activities but not call them thinking skills. But they were developed as an idea, um, as a group of activities that not only um, help support students learn the curriculum content or the topic that we're looking at, but to develop skills that help them think more and um, develop appropriate skills for outside the classroom and future life. So things like communication, evaluation, problem solving or prioritizing, they're all things that we need in everyday life. And these activities help focus students' minds and help us as teachers develop those skills. So what I've done is I've highlighted nine different activities for tonight's session. Some of them you'll probably have seen before or even do in your classroom. And the first one of these is a word map. Now word maps do tend to be used in primary classrooms a lot and they're usually used for spelling or vocabulary. Essentially, they are words with a description mm. underneath it. So for example here you can see as I move the spotlight over my mat, I can pick up specific words that I want to focus on. So we're going to look at evaluating, judging the value of some things later on in the session. We're also going to be focused on interpreting some data 
to explain the meaning of. So I'm using my word mat and my spotlight to tell my students, unfortunately you guys this time, um, what we're going to be looking at throughout the session and what the key terminology is. This particular word map is all about different words associated with thinking skills. So I'm just going to show you it. It was developed by SNL, and you can go onto the SNL website to find more of these. But you can see here is the word map, and all the different words are associated with thinking skills. So again, hopefully some of these will be familiar to you. But what we want to do is bring all these into context with our students and develop those skills. So what I used there was the spotlight. For those of you that aren't familiar with the spotlight, you can find it under the tools icon, and you can see it down here. I'm using the primary skin, um, so everything's in blue, but you can see spotlight is here, and I was using um, a square, oops, sorry, I wasn't. I was using a square spotlight there, which I can move around. Really focusing my student's mind. Okay. My next example is the odd one out. Now, this is a really popular starter. So, odd one out is just a game. It can be used in all sorts of subjects, but the key is to make sure that there are multiple answers so our students have to think. They have to justify what they're doing. So, I'm going to ask, what do you guys think the odd one out is here? Which of these is the odd one out? If you use that chat functionality, oh, someone said A there. Now, I can see it there, Amanda, so thank you. But if we're in my class, oh, someone else has said D. So, D, the, oh, the burgers, lots of them. Oh, now there's everything. <laughs> so, you've all told me what you think the odd one out was, but nobody has said why. Why do you think that? Now, someone's just said you can eat the others. So, mate, it's the penguins because we can eat these. Brilliant. Amanda there, thank you. It, bananas, because there's only five bananas, but there's six of everything else. Now, maybe it's, it's um, the burgers, because they don't grow. You know, we grow all these. The, the penguins grow. Burgers are cooked. Well done. Different things. We could eat the penguins. <laughs> I'm getting a conversation going. I can see all this chat coming in now. I'm getting you to think about your answer not just tell me what it is. So I'm going to bring another one in. We don't have to do this one, guys, but if you want to, feel free. What could be the odd one out here? Notice that I've changed the medium that my students are looking at. So, not a double digit, not a prime number. Great. We're not looking at images anymore. We're now looking at numbers. So this is a really popular starter for teachers. And if you search on Promethean Planet, um, just type in odd one out into the search bar, you'll actually find 11 different examples of whole flip charts made of these, uh, one of which was actually made by Janice, our presenter today. And I've actually put um, a link here just to show you. This is a maths example. Um, but here you can see where I got some of the examples from. But we start to use different mediums. So we're not just looking at numbers. Let's see, which is the odd one out here? So we've got four, we've got eight, eight, eight. So maybe it's this one, but this one's double fours. It's interesting to see what your students pick up on. Which is odd one out? This one's green. This one has less uh, fluid into it. We can start to analyze what our students pick up. It's a really nice way to get a communication going with your students. So odd one out. Hopefully some of you will have seen that that idea before. You might not know it as a thinking skill, but it is. We're getting our students to think about what their answers are. So the, the things that I've used on this page are to set things off the page. So hopefully um, some of you will have discovered how to do this already. But you can set any image, shape, or um, text off the page so your students can't see it until you're ready and you're able to drag that in. I also used a link here. So you can link to anything, including other flip charts, by going to insert and link to that file. So as long as you have that file downloaded, you can link to it.
Now, although odd one out is slightly different, it is essentially a way of classifying things, so putting things into groups, which is the odd one. Um, but here, we're going to look at classification on a wider scale. So this is another example of something that you probably already do in your classroom. Um, lots of teachers use classification as a way to categorize information. Now, in this example, I've gone for simple placements of instruments. The students have to classify the instruments into the correct place in the orchestra. Now, I've used three different ways here. I've used an image, so we have the harp here. I've also put the name of the instrument on, and I've also linked to the sound file. Hopefully you can hear this. Now, if I was going to do this with my students, I wouldn't want to make it so easy. I would either use an image and the sound, or maybe the text and the sound, or just the sound itself. So a, a mixture of them. I wouldn't necessarily use all three. But I wanted to highlight in this session that you can um, have, add the sound in and that you can use pictures or text. So the idea is that my students would come up, play the sound, and decide where the instrument would go. This one's obviously quite an easy example, but I can make it as difficult as I want. We'll put that over in percussion. What's important for the thinking part of this exercise is for students to understand why they're placing the item in that category. What makes it different? Um, what's the reason behind it? And how do they know? So remember, we're not just testing knowledge we, or getting students to guess. Um, sorry, we are testing knowledge. We don't want students to just guess or to be reading out of a textbook. We actually want them to understand um, these processes. Now, there's a couple of things that I've got going on here. So you can see that I've placed my instruments into what looks like a 3D box. And I'm just going to take that box apart oops, to show you how I've made that. So we often use um, shapes that are locked down with things hidden behind them. And that's all that's happening here. It's just that this shape looks like a box. So if I can select that box, look, I can pull it away, and you can see that everything's behind it. And the front of this box, there we are, the front of the box, this bit, sits on the top layer of the software, and the instruments are sitting on the middle so that they look like they're hidden. So it's an illusion of 3D effect. The other thing that I've obviously done on this page, then, is to insert the sound files. So I want to show you how to attach sound files to an image or a piece of text. I'm just going to type text in here. So I'm just going to go with the, uh, the word cat because I know there's a sound file for that. I'm going to go into my resource library. Oops. I'm not. I'm going to insert. And I can insert a link to a file if I have them on file. or in my resource library, sorry, I am going there, are lots of different sound files. I can go in and find the animal ones, and you can find them down here. They're all highlighted. If you hover over, there we are, cat. Bring it up. What I want to do with this one is group them to uh, make this one transparent so it looks like it's disappeared, and then group them to group them together. Bear with me, catching everything. Hopefully this is working. Nope. There we go. And you can hear the cat. So lots of different things going on on the page. Janice, is there any questions at this stage before I go on to the next? No, I think we're okay. There are some people who are having um, problems with sound, saying that your sound seems to be cutting out every once in a while. 
I'm not having that problem myself, um, so I'm not sure what to advise, but hopefully it'll all be coming through in the recording, okay? Okay, brilliant. Sorry, guys, we will keep going. So my next example, so number four of our nine, is a Venn diagram. Now, I'm sure at some point everyone will have tried a Venn diagram, and it's actually one of my favorite activities. The reason I like it so much is that it can be relevant for any subject, so maths, English, geography, in this case I've used language, but in addition, you can also differentiate to suit your class's needs by either adding an extra circle, so I've used three, or by making the statements or objects or text um, more challenging for our students, so we can differentiate quite easily. In this example, I've used images and words um, from an English as a second language lesson. So the students have to place the animals into either the ocean, the jungle, or the farm. And these are all Spanish words. I haven't used any English words on the page apart from um, our title here, but nothing for the activity. And I'm getting our students to decide they want to, which, where things live. So we can pick up our octopus here and place it in the jungle. Now notice that I've grouped the Spanish word for octopus with the image, but it doesn't appear on our white background. It only appears once we've put it in. Because not only do am I testing their knowledge of the animals, I'm going to test their knowledge of the language as well. So I want them to tell me the right word, the correct word for the animal before they place it in and we're giving some instant feedback. So we're letting them know that they've got it right. Now, there are obviously some that could live in a couple. Could it live all? Could it live in the jungle, the ocean, and the farm? Well, a fish technically could, depends on the type of the fish, so we could put it in there. And you can see that we've got both of the things there. Remember, we're testing different things, and it is about getting that communication going in your classroom. Why do they think it lives there? Why could a fish live in all those areas? Get them to talk to you. So I just saw that Janice asked you the question there, because she knew this was coming up. But have any of you um, used Venn diagrams before? I can see there, but some people, once they love them, they're great to get learners thinking, because often things don't stick into one category. So Venn diagrams become really useful. While you're all chatting in, I'm just going to quickly go to my resource library and type in Venn Diagram, see it was there, and let my resource library run a search. There are already some fantastic templates built into your software. And Venn Diagrams are one of the templates that you can find. By using the search, uh, search box at the top here, Typing in Venn, I'm going to let the software do the work. Hopefully, it's not going to take too much longer. And the templates for Venn diagrams will come up at the bottom. And all I need to do then is pick the most appropriate one for my lesson. There you go. You can pick the most appropriate one for my lesson and edit the text boxes appropriate to you. So you don't have to build everything from scratch. There are blank ones, as you can see here. Or there are ones that are slightly more complicated. If I bring this in, for example, there you go. All I need to do, double-click my title and change it to my particular lesson. I didn't have to make any of this myself. So do utilize your resource library where appropriate. You can, of course, make your own. I saw that uh, statement come in as well. Okay, moving on then. This example is a twist on the classic game of dominoes. And although I'm showing a maths example, it isn't limited to maths. I have used this in my history lessons uh, to match dates and events from World War II. Um, but as long as you've got a top and a tail, then you can play dominoes. The idea is to ask students to match up the dominoes. Now here I'm using fractions and images on a grid. The students may have similar or the same cards even on their desk. And what we're asking them to do is come up to the board and place them on this outside track and then find the matching. So I'm looking for one third here. 
So I've got to find something. Well, this looks like one third. Break it down. So one third is in red. Those two thirds are in white. So then I've got two thirds here. And I can keep going. Now, the key to this, and as we're talking about thinking skills, is that when you're creating your dominoes, you need to think about mixing up the images or symbols that your students are matching. So this activity just isn't about matching fractions with a number, but we're checking understanding as we're going through. So can they understand what two thirds means as um, a grid, as a diagram? Now, if you'd like to try this activity, but you don't want to have to build all these templates, remember that you can always visit prometheanplanet.com, and again, there are lots of pre-written material. This particular one was actually written by a former colleague of ours um, called Chris Stone. So there are lots of maths ones, um, but you can find examples for other types of domino activities as well. So the last four examples, and I am aware of time, need a little bit more explanation. Because in some cases, they're a twist on the actual original activity. So this one was a map from memory. And without, now, without telling you my age, um, I actually used to do this with an overhead projector and a piece of paper. Um, and before that, I used to do it, print it out with an A3 piece of paper and hold it up. But the idea is that I'm going to put my class into groups, usually three or four people in a group. In each group, a scribe is assigned, someone that's going to do all the writing or drawing, and the other team members each get a number. When you ask them, number one, for, uh, when you ask them, number one, for example, will come up and look at a particular image. They'll go back to their desks and tell the scribe what they saw. Number two then come up, look at the same image, and go back to the scribe. Number threes, etc. The object is for the team as a whole to make a perfect replica of the picture that I haven't revealed to you yet, but I will do. So I hope that makes sense. It's very quick. But on an IWB, what I've done is I've taken that activity with one difference. The difference being that all the team members are going to see the image at once using the revealer tool. That means everything else stays the same. So we're going to make sure that one person does all the writing and the others are looking, thinking, and communicating. But we're getting them to work together. So we're going to look at this image for 10 seconds. And I'm going to cover it back up again. And I wonder what you're remembering. Could you actually describe what you saw to somebody else to make a copy? Can we work as a team? So it may be that every minute I reveal it again, let them have a next little bit of time to look at it. Hopefully you're all taking it in. And we've hidden it again. Now what the important thing about this activity is, we obviously want them to understand the image underneath. So we've got the curriculum content in the image. We want them to understand that cigarettes do all these different things to your health um, and that ammonia that's found in a cigarette is actually in toilet cleaner and do they want to breathe that in? So it's a health lesson. But also we've, we've got them thinking about how they're talking to each other. As teachers, we're listening to the communication that's going on around the classroom. So are they working as a group? Do they have a strategy? Are you hearing things like, um, we, we need the picture in the bottom corner, or right, we've got all the pictures, where's the words? All of that is really good observation skills and teamwork, both obviously that are essential for the real world in inverted commas. Now, although I'm, re um, I'm using a revealer for this example, you could use the hidden icon um, hidden action instead. We've demonstrated hidden on quite a few um, different webinars and you can view those at our YouTube channel that Janice will speak about later. Now I've used here an image with labels 
it's quite simple, but it's getting uh, students to focus on key areas. There are some quite technical words here that I might want to go through, um, especially cut um, these ones up here with my students later. In general, this activity is probably going to take you about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how long you give your students in between and how much time you want to dedicate to it. But it's a great way to introduce something like this to them without just saying we're going to look at the, the um, negative effects of smoking today. So it's just adding that extra element to the activity. They're still going to um, learn what the negative effects of smoking are, but we don't have to be so explicit. Now, I'm seeing there's lots of chat there, Janice, so is everything okay? Yes, everything's fine. Just answering um, questions as we go along. So um, somebody was asking how you switch to the primary skin because they used Studio and didn't realize that there was the primary view. Um, so I just put that on for people. I've also just put the YouTube link. So um, uh, some people have joined us for the first time and are really enjoying it. So I'm sharing the link to YouTube to watch some of the other recordings. Um, Patty gave a good idea, good idea for the last page as well. So she was saying, you know, you could use transparency to just reveal some of it at the time. So some people just commenting on uh, further ideas for what you're doing as well. Brilliant. I, I love that because, you know, I haven't actually thought of using transparency, and that's why these webinars are so great. We use this software every day, but you still learn different things from people about how they interact with it in their classroom. And it's so interesting to, to hear that type of thing. But I digress. I will move on. So with three more left, and this is my ultimate favorite thinking skill. This is my personal choice. Um, this is a Diamond Nine activity. As you can see, we have nine blank cards set out in a diamond. So we have one at the top, which I've labeled the most important, two, three in the middle, another two, and then the bottom, the least important. And um, a diamond nine activity is exactly that. We have nine cards underneath that we are going to place in our diamond. The challenge with this activity is that there is no right answer. There is no wrong answer. Students have to think and justify their choices. So we're looking at what is needed for a healthy lifestyle. So. It may be that the students have all these cards on their desks and they're going to put them in their diagram first um, and then you're going to come to the board. But we're just going to do this here now. So I'm going to say <coughs> that right now, eating five portions of fruit and veg a day is the most important thing you can do for a healthy lifestyle. I'm going to put this down here. Now, if you disagree with me, please let me know or let Janice know. And I'm going to bring out something else. Oh, look, don't smoke. We just looked at that. Oh, drink water. Right, I'm going to put this here. What I would want to be happening in my classroom is that students would be shouting out and saying, no, I don't agree. No, that doesn't work there. That's not happening. I want this in that place. So I'm going to bring them all out. Oh, this is our favorite. Get eight hours of sleep. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to move this. Oh, I'll have to move this down here and that there because I think that as teachers, we, uh, we never get enough sleep. We're always thinking. So eight hours of sleep. Someone's put, don't drink alcohol Not down here. Yeah, maybe we need alcohol. I think there's a caffeine one in here. So that would definitely be at the top. But you can see that we're having that discussion. Now, in my classroom, <laughs> someone's put, changed my mind. Brilliant. That's what we want you to do. To make it interesting, what I would do in my classroom is get them to do this individually first. Show them the nine cards and get them to draw it out in their book or have the cards on their desk and justify their top and bottom answers. Why, what do they think is the most important? What do they think is the least important? I'd then ask them to talk to their partner or in a group. Um, do they have the same answers? We actually want them to, to disagree, to argue their point to one another to come up with a compromise, because that's the skill we're working on. Communication, prioritizing, and compromise. Finally, I would do this on the board, like we're doing here, so that at each stage, you can listen to the communication that's happening um, with, with the partners, and you can see where your students' heads are at. 
Now, because we're going to eventually have to have a consensus decision, I have um, placed on the little letters here so that if we had learner response systems in our classroom, we could take a class vote and eventually come up with um, a consensus about where each of these would go. I'm not going to do that with you today, but you can see how that would work, just voting on what is the top one and go with the class majority. It's a really, really useful tool. Now, this one's a quite simple one. We've done one previously for why um, Hitler blitz Britain. You may have seen that in a previous webinar. Um, it's also a really good technique for thinking about how you would structure essays if you are a secondary teacher or you want an extended piece of writing. Because if they're answering this question and writing it out, we want to spend the most time on this, next paragraph on these two, then here, then here, and the least time on there. So it really helps you structure your thoughts when there is no right or wrong answer. So we're justifying all the way down. Someone's just said, has the sound gone? Hopefully you can all hear me. I can still hear you, Sam. Brilliant. Because the next one's a mystery. <laughs> so, yeah, sound is back. So the next um, activity I want to talk to you about, or the next thinking skill activity, is a mystery. And it is actually a mystery. It's something that we want our students to work out. This activity involves us not giving our students um, a na the name of the lesson or telling them what we're going to be looking at today or anything explicit. We want them to work it all out for themselves. All we're going to do is give them a set of statements that around a question. Now, the question could be anything. Why did Mrs. Smith run out of milk? It doesn't have to be linked to the topic that you're going to look at. In the case that we're doing, um, it is a little bit linked, um, but we're getting students to look at lots of different pieces of information. Anyway, I'm digressing a, uh, a little bit. This takes up a whole section. So I've put my mystery section into another flip chart. because The first activity we need to do with the mystery is obviously to read all the statements. All my students are going to know or see is why did Doncaster become a coastal resort in 2030. Now, for those of you that aren't from the UK, um, Doncaster is not near the coast um, currently. So why it might it be a coastal resort in 2013 should get our heads scratching and some brain cells working. Inside the box, I've hidden 30 different statements that all relate to this question. What I want our students to do is firstly to read all those statements. So we drag them out and we would read them. So Doncaster is just off the M18 motorway doesn't really help me answer the question, it will have some relevance. Since 1930, the average world temperature has increased by 0.2 degrees. Well, that's got me thinking, I might understand what we're looking at then in this lesson. Most electricity is generated by power stations and fossil fuels. I'm getting the sense, it's a geography lesson, and that we're gonna, we might be looking at global warming or coastal erosion, but I would have to continue to read. So I'd be pulling these out and looking at the statements. So remember, I'm not telling my students any further information. I want them to work all of this out for themselves. Once they've read the statements, I want to have a quick discussion. Do they, can they um, tell me why they think Doncaster might be a coastal resort? And then the next activity is to categorize all those statements. Now, like I said, this is a geography lesson, so I've put some categories down here. But I can bring them up and decide, is this social, environmental, economic, political, relevant or not, or is it just background? And I'm going to colour code them. So I'm going to use the fill tool, and I'm going to say that this was family, so it's black, so I don't need to fill that one, so that was a poor choice to start with. Let's find another one. It is predicted that global warming will make the UK wetter. Okay, well, that might be, I think that's background to what we're looking at. So I'll go with pink and start colour coding. Oops, to do the whole thing. The idea here is we're getting our students not just to read the statements, which doesn't take that much thought, but to actually start to prioritise, categorise them, 
and think about what it is that they're learning. Now, this is a really big life skill. If you think about all the information we get in a, on a daily basis, if we didn't put it into little categories or prioritize it in our heads, we actually wouldn't be able to take it all in. If, you know, if the adverts on TV got the same amount of, rele um, same amount of priority um, to us as the, the postman at the door and the news app, the news that's on the TV, we, we actually, actually go into overload. So it's a really good way of getting students to prioritize. It's also great, again, to hear how they're thinking and how they're going about their tasks. Once we've categorized the information, we should be in a better place now to actually start to answer the, um, the question. And you can start to tease the question and the answer out of them. Don't get them to just give you one word answers. So why is the 2030 appropriate in this example? Or how will it affect the people? How can we stop it? So we're really getting down to the nitty gritty now and we're having a conversation. And then finally, when they've worked out the answer, they've read it all and they've understood the concept, we're going to get them to write it up in a detailed answer. Now, I've used a writing frame here just to add some scaffolding for students to work with. Um, but it could be that in your class you prefer to do a podcast or um, a blog about it. It doesn't matter how we get our students to um, formally write their answer, as long as we're doing that and we're documenting it. But you can see I've used key sentences here to stop my students from only picking out um, little bits of information. So Doncaster Inn, and to take about the geography, where is it? Could be a coastal resort in because it will only happen if. What will the effects be and how could it be stopped? I've also added down here their personal opinion, so that a chance for them to talk about it if they want. Now that was quite a lengthy um, one and it's also quite complicated. Janice, is there any questions that people want me to answer on mysteries? No, I think that we're okay. Okay. Well, in that case, I'm going to go on to my final example, which is not there, no, because it's here, <laughs> which is a living grass. Now, don't worry, nothing's going to come shooting out of your screens or sprout wings, but the grass is going to come alive in a contextual sense. So living graphs are useful when you're looking at interpreting data. Um, because what we're going to do is give contextual um, statements and place them on the graph. So I've got a graph here of rainfall and temperature. And typically, I may have asked my students to look at the graph and tell me how much rainfall there was in August. And they would have looked along and said, OK, there is going to be 170 blah, blah, blah millimetres of rainfall. When, or asked a question, when is the wet season? And they've told me it is, begins in May and ends in October. But that information, although valid, has no real relevance to them. And also, really, they can't see how it affects their lives. So by adding conceptual statements like this one, Okay. And making sure that the students can not only analyse the information, but think about what it means to real people, real life, and ultimately what this learning, uh, to make sure that what they're learning has relevance to them. So here you can see it says the heavy rains are causing the river to rise dramatically. Yusuf watches as the dikes which he has been reinforcing are given their first real test. Will his house be safe? So. I know that I'm looking at heavy rainfall and they're going to be getting tests. So maybe my statement lives between June and July, just about here. Someone's just put that's cool. <laughs> um, if I go for another one, it says, Kata does not like this month, the hottest month of the year, and the rains have not begun yet. However, humidity is beginning to rise. And she's now noticing that the flies and mosquito activity. So let's actually analyze the graph. It's not quite the wet season, hottest here, so we need to put it up here. So it started. You can see how it's got relevance to the students now. Now this one um, is just a specific geography example, but remember the graph could be any type of information, and you're just giving it con uh, a context. So making sure that students see the relevance. 
Again, it is another one of my favourites, and I really do hope that you like it. Um, are there any questions before I pass over to Janice, um, who's going to finish us off for this evening? Sorry that I've run over time, but I hope it was useful to you. Um, I think there are a couple questions there. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with, with typing. Um, I think what we'll do is there are some questions that have come through, but because not everybody can see the questions, I can only see the questions, even though I'm sharing the answers to everybody. What I will do is um, print out the chat and go back and have a look at the questions, and I'll send out some of these answers to you guys in emails, because I think it would be of interest to everybody and not just a particular person that answered the question. Um, one question we've got um, says, uh, are these nine thinking skills the only ones you think are worth teaching as they are the only ones which um, show relevance to their lives? So, um, no, there are lots of other different types of, thinking, uh, different types of thinking skills. I just chose these nine, A, because I like them, um, but B, because they're, they're relevant to using the technology in your classroom, so they're easily conversable. Um, you don't have to um, put much of work in. And once you've got them on your board, obviously, they're there forever. Um, so it's just it was just my personal choice with with half an hour. So no, there are some. And if um, if you want, I'm, I'm sure, Janice, if we want to send out some um, the, the link to the Thinking Skills website. Yeah, we can send out the links to, to websites that Sam and I used when we were talking about this webinar and putting them together. Um, and, and you can have a look at them. We only have a half an hour, and, and we're already 40 minutes into that half an hour. Um, <laughs> so if, you know, if this is something that people have found interesting, then we will be putting together another schedule of webinars for the next school year. Um, so we are always looking for ideas for titles. So if you do have any ideas of things that you'd like us to cover in a webinar, please just let us know. Getting some really nice comments coming in there as well. I think people have really enjoyed what they've seen, seen tonight. Um, so to, just brilliant. to finish, oh, Sam is going to turn that page for me. Um, just want to remind you about Promethean Planet. So if you're not already a member of Promethean Planet, I do recommend that you get onto the site and register yourself because it's a huge wealth of information to get support and learning how to do all of the fantastic things that Sam has shown you tonight. So the areas that I would focus on if you are going um, onto Promethean Planet is the resources, so make use of other user-created resources, so flip charts that teachers have created used in their own classroom, preparing for everybody else to use. Also, under professional development, um, that is where our webinars are advertised, but um, if you go to the one that's called videos, uh, videos, tutorials, and something else under professional development, um, there are some really great little video tutorials that you can watch, and that's also where you'll find the active tips, um, which are another one that's quite quite good. Um, so lots going on there and worth having a look around Promethean Planet. Just seen one question coming in. Are there materials for teaching essay writing? I think I have come across that in searching Promethean Planet before. Um, but you just have to go on and just sort of play around with the, the search criteria and see what you come up with. Sam has now just put on the screen our email addresses. So if you do have any questions after this session, please feel free to send us an email. And as I said, we are always looking for titles, and we will be um, starting to get our titles and dates um, for the next school year. So if you do have some ideas, please just send them on to us or any questions that you might have. We are also on Twitter, so if you um, do use Twitter, our handle is at Promethean UK and I. Sam's going to turn to the last one just to finish off. Um, we do have a new product that we are currently beta testing, and anybody is um, able to register and have a look at it and give us some feedback, and that's our, our um, class flow website. Um, so just to put that up to finish off. Thank you very much for everybody that's joined us tonight and your patience for us going over time. Um, I hope this is useful, and I hope to see you on our next webinar um, in June, which is on literacy. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sam. That was brilliant. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice night. Bye.